Well, welcome. Um, welcome to Notre Dame. Welcome to Alumni Day. And hi, Carol. I see a, a friend in the Thorovian uh, from the Concord Museum, where I'll be in a few days. Um, so it's good to see somebody from Henry Thoreau's hometown of Concord, Massachusetts. Um, so welcome to our beautiful campus. Uh, the weather is being kind to us, and I'm glad because the campus is, um, of course, looking particularly splendid, all the new plantings and all the new buildings, and I hope you'll enjoy your time here. So um, I came here to Notre Dame about seven years ago, looking forward, uh, hoping very much to write a biography of Henry David Thoreau. Um, I had been working on Thoreau, thinking about him, reading him, really back since high school. And I did uh, my first book on Thoreau, on Thoreau and science, and then went on and did some other writers, some other uh, topics. And I was in that slump after, my, after a book when I wasn't sure what I was going to do next, when I, I was thinking about things that needed to be done in American literature. And it occurred to me that nobody had written a biography of Thoreau, a full comprehensive biography, since Walter Harding's back in 1965. There had been some treatments and a, a wonderful intellectual biography by Bob Richardson, but in terms of just the whole general picture, and I thought, oh, I don't want to do a biography. Um, and at the moment, I was sort of freezing up thinking about that. I heard a voice saying to me, but you're going to do that biography. It was very spooky. Um, so uh, <laughs> that was a bit unnerving, um, and I took a long walk, which was a very Thoreauvian thing to do, and when I got back, I had settled it all. I would be doing that as my next book. So that was uh, going on to about 10 years ago, and the book um, came out officially published on uh, July 12th, uh, 2017, and it's, uh, here it is, nice uh, uh, thick thing. It's coming out in paperback soon. Um, meanwhile, it uh, got a lot of good press and uh, was one of many things that came out in honor of Thoreau's 200th birthday last year. That was the big date that I had in view as I was um, imagining what this biography could do and to be. And one of the most important things to me was that it, before, all readers, anybody who is interested in Thoreau, not just a technical study. Um, and the other demand, and this is the sort of thing that Thoreau places on you, um, is that it be um, a literary work in itself, not just a book about literature, but that it would at least aspire to be itself a beautifully told story. So I spent um, a, a fair amount of time at the end of the writing process trying to uh, really go back and, and looking at every, every sentence, every paragraph, and thinking about if, if, if I didn't know anything about Thoreau, would I be captured? So it really is a kind of design to capture and enrapture people um, with Thoreau. Um, he's been a huge part of my life and somebody that um, has taught me a lot over the years and been just really just basically very good company. And I think he might be for others as well. So uh, this is the most famous portrait we have of him, um, taken uh, shortly after um, he published Walden, a couple of years later. And the emphasis on writing a whole human life, I actually wanted that as the uh, subtitle, but my publisher said, no, let's just keep it very, very, very simple. So it's just Henry David Thoreau, A Life. But I liked the whole human life because of this uh, uh, moment, uh, a nice example of Thoreau's wit. What youthful philosophers and experimentalists we are, there's not one of my readers who has yet lived a whole human life. And so that sense that he always had of self-consciousness about living a good life um, is something that we've lost, and I think uh, in, in thinking about him, we, we have all sorts of incorrect uh, uh, stereotypes about Thoreau as a misanthrope and a hermit and things that uh, might have been true of somebody, but it certainly wasn't true of the human being that I've come to know. Um, so don't fail me now there. So there's the title of the book um, as, it, as it developed and a beautifully, beautifully designed um, at University of Chicago Press. And I will say they were absolutely wonderful to work with. 
Um, and so um, I hope they have copies if you're interested at the uh, bookstore. They have had them in the past. Um, and uh, if not, I know Amazon, of course, Chicago would love to sell you one. Uh, or more. It's uh, been adopted in some. I'm having trouble with this thing. Now, one of the interesting things about, so I said this is the first photograph, um, or one of the, the best known uh, photographs, uh, not, um, and, and the first photograph. We have another image, but it's a drawing. Um, these look the same, and this is the sort of thing as a biographer. We don't have film footage of him. We don't have a recording of his voice. We only have um, photographs that were taken at this moment, this sitting, and then um, just a few years later when he was dying. Um, and other than that, everything is just description or our imaginations. So as a biographer, you start trying to get a sense of the person. And so there were, there were three images taken uh, in 1856 of Thoreau. Um, it's same sitting, same studio, and of course this is the old-fashioned uh, 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 daguerreotype. And so you had to sit very formally for about five minutes while the camera t took your image. Um, and I realized um, a while back that they're not identical. And so I got intrigued, and this, we own this one. This is the first, uh, my theory is this is the first image. Uh, that we own it because it's uh, in the Library of Congress. And you can see it's, it's rather stiff, rather formal. Um, this more rugged looking image, I think this was the first one. What had happened was uh, he was visiting friends and they, get, they got quite raucous. This was the, the Worcester group. And um, they were very playful and witty and raucous and fun with each other. And they dragged him into a photo stu uh, studio. The story is that he was basically kicking and screaming. He didn't want his picture taken. They were saying, oh, come on, come on. Um, and so they're sitting him down. And you can see how must his hair is. And uh, you know these crazy cowlicks and everything. And of course, everybody loves this and a little drag down. And then, and you just see the eyes still are, they're trying, he's trying not to smile. There's just this suppressed and a little gleam in his eyes. So this is my favorite photograph. Um, but this was the Library of Congress, you know, again, um, it, it came cheap. It was free because we own it. So the publishers went with this one. But I noticed somebody went in and smoothed down his hair and basically told him, Henry, <laughs> <laughs> sit still, don't smile. And so he adopts much more calm, formal, appropriate for a, a, a fine formal photograph. So you, you start getting, even if we don't, the little bits that we have, you try to use your imagination and set the situation up in your mind's eye. And I've always been thinking, uh, curious, like who was it who went in and, and you know, tried to s pat down his hair and uh, smooth out that crazy cowlick? So a few things about Thoreau, because I'm not assuming that you know any, uh, anything about him. Um, by the way, I say Thoreau because that is the way the family pronounced the name and that still pronounced that name in Concord, his hometown. But if you've been calling him Thoreau all your life, that's fine. It's a French name and the French will tell you uh, with some pointedness uh, that we're both wrong. It uh, should be pronounced in the French way, which would be something more like Toro. Um, OK, anyway, so it's the same person. Um, so a few things about him. Uh, yes, he was uh, born in Concord, Massachusetts. Um, oh, wrong button. Sorry about that. That's one of the dangers of this thing. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson famously became his friend and mentor after Emerson moved uh, to his hometown. Yes, this is the guy who lived at Walden Pond for two years, 1845 to 47. While he was at the pond, he walked in and famously got himself jailed for non-payment of poll taxes, uh, which he had refused to pay for a number of years in protest of government uh, policies, which he regarded as violent and coercive. Um, and so he was jailed just for one night, and that one night in jail um, resulted in a lecture, and then finally in the essay that uh, has become famous around the world, A Civil Disobedience, that he published uh, short you know, back in uh, uh, 1849, a few years later. Uh, later that year, he began his, his very uh, close, careful studies in natural science. 
Um, and this wasn't the old-fashioned stuff. This was cutting edge. He was modeling his work on Alexander von Humboldt, a German uh, uh, scientist who was really in some important ways the founder of modern science, and uh, on Charles Darwin. He became a pioneer in this work in the science of ecology, which was a field that actually didn't exist yet, so um, this is pretty innovative work for him. He published Walden uh, in 1854, and even as Walden was coming off the presses, he stood up and delivered slavery in Massachusetts, what they called uh, words that burn, a protest statement against um, the slavery. Um, uh, the, the formal recognition of slavery and the enforcement of it through the Fugitive Slave Act, which required every citizen to identify uh, anyone that they thought might be a slave and uh, render them to the government for um, uh, capture and return, return to their masters in the South. And this was just extremely controversial flashpoint. And uh, Thoreau, even as Walden was being printed, was in framing and standing up delivering this incendiary speech where he doubted that his work in Walden anymore had value in such a political climate in, an, in an, a country where this could be possible. So I like to imagine, again, those two together in tension, part of, part of what he was truly about. All his life, he kept this a magnificent journal. We have over two million words. Um, some of it he destroyed, so we don't even have it all. Um, and many say that that is his true masterpiece. And um, I found the journal of immense help in trying to understand you know, who he was, what he th thought about, um, what really drove him. Um, I'm getting a touch for this. So we have, of course, a sense of the uh, people in his life, his family. I won't go through all that. There's just not nearly enough time. Um, but you know, his, this is the only image we have of his mother, uh, a, a very passionate, outspoken woman, and obviously intensely bright, and his father, a, a soft-spoken, gentle man who was a craftsman. The family made their money uh, through uh, making pencils and various other uh, sort of artisan goods like uh, marbled papers and sandpaper. Um, we don't have the missing uh, is his, uh, Henry's older brother John. Uh, we don't have an image of him. Uh, John died in Henry's arms uh, when Henry was, I'm getting this right, uh, 24. They were very, very close and this was absolutely a trauma that um, um, set Henry Thoreau on his, his path really. Um, outward into nature to try to, in a sense, as he said, live, live for two, live for the two of them who'd grown up together in the outdoors. Um, his elder sister, um, Helen, died also tragically young. She was an anti-slavery activist, and Henry called her his moral lodestar, um, always admired her and looked up to her. Um, his younger sister, Sophia, uh, they were buddies. Friends said that uh, Sophia was Henry in a skirt. Um, we know so little about her. I think it's really tragic because it's clear um, that she was an absolutely remarkable woman. And much of, um, I mean, really that we have thorough uh, today in his papers, his manuscripts, knowledge about him is because she was so fiercely pr uh, uh, protective of her brother and his reputation and made sure to, to carry his papers forward and make sure that he got the attention that she felt her dear brother so richly deserved. Um, and of course, Emerson stands at the head of the people we know and he's surrounded by friends. I, I could have filled this slide with a whole lot more. Some of these, these folks you, you have heard of, um, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne um, and Thoreau got along famously. Uh, Bronson Alcott was uh, one of his very closest friends, and Louisa May Alcott grew up playing um, and, and, and having adventures um, as a little girl with a circle of children around Henry Thoreau. Um, Emerson, of course, the kind of uh, public intellectual for the nation, uh, he and Emerson friends, but often rivals, because uh, they both uh, were, were very competitive. Um, Emerson's uh, wife, Lydian, uh, they were 
was very close. She and Henry were very close. Um, and here's little Edward Eddie uh, on her lap. Eddie grew up to write um, uh, one of, really in a way, the first biography of Thoreau, a very moving portrait of uh, a man that he adored growing up. Uh, Henry Thoreau is remembered by a young friend. Um, and then Frederick Douglass, who stayed with the Thoreaus um, early in his abolitionist career, became a correspondent of Helen Thoreau's. And it's not too hard, we don't have records from that time, but it's not too hard to, to uh, imagine that Frederick Douglass and Henry Thoreau um, uh, communicated, uh, at least knew each other. Thoreau makes uh, many references to uh, Douglas in his work, which was highly influential on the way that Thoreau thought of Walden. So the town itself, the landscape became a kind of character in my imagination. It doesn't look very spectacular. This is a photograph of uh, the river and the countryside around um, late 19th, maybe about 1900. And it's, it's uh, pleasant, bucolic, but not spectacular scenery, but, but the intimacy of the landscape and the way it sort of draws you into its little corners and patches was something that I imagined uh, Thoreau getting uh, not well overwhelmed with nature's grandeur, right, but, but just involved in all the little copses and corners and rivers and bays um, and glens and uh, walking, a great country for walking. The town itself, if you go there, this was taken last year, um, is of course a bustling tourist town with a, um, a, a real vibrancy. And here's um, the mill dam and uh, um, full of cars and tourists and Carol smiling because it probably looks, it's, I can just hear it right now. It's, it's like a weird contradiction, this, this wonderful uh, a town that's the center of American intellectual culture and the um, birthplace of the American Revolution, right? Um, and it's full of commerce and noise and motorcycles screaming past. Um, one thing, it's made it a nice place to visit, um, and I do every chance I get, is that so much of the town retains these, these core buildings Many of them are exactly the same as those that Henry knew. So here's the same space um, just after Henry's death. And you can see, uh, if you look at the chimney line there, these chimneys are, it indicate that these, this line of buildings, same buildings, they're still standing today. So here's the, there's the same line of chimneys. And these, these are the same buildings, right? And so you can really walk through the town and get a sense of uh, this is the place um, that Henry knew. And you can get a sense of the past there and many layers of the past, which I particularly love. Um, so as you're doing that, uh, Walden gives us um, on the title page the image of the famous house at Walden Pond, which is long gone. There's a replica in the parking lot by Walden Pond next to the famous statue of Thoreau. Um, and Sophia uh, was an artist among her other talents. And so this is the only uh, image we really have of the cabin, what it looked like. Henry always called it a house, so we'll call it a house. And so this, of course, is based on that image and a uh, little controversy over whether it really looked like that, but uh, you get the idea. Um, the way it's set. One of the ideas we have about Walden is that it was somewhere out in the wilderness. And this, it really reorients, changes your sense of what it was, what it meant, and what he was doing out there if you realize how very close to town it was. So here's the center of Concord. At this time, the Thoreaus are living in this, uh, what they called the Texas house right there. And so uh, my line wandered a little bit um, on, on the, stupid computer, but uh, this would have been the walk, uh, the, the way uh, Henry took a shortcut into his house site here on Walden Pond. And it's just a little over a mile, um, right and still in the township. This was uh, everybody's backyard, the pond. Uh, kids went swimming there, everybody, you know, went, uh, they went fishing there, families went uh, picnicking there. And uh, so it was a bit like setting up a 
tent in your backyard. Uh, so there was a main road out of town here and a railroad cut through here and his cabin was visible from both. And uh, there was a little pathway that cut down into the favorite fishing cove right here. So it, he was not exactly um, hidden away, shall we say. If anything, he was more conspicuous right there with everybody saying, hey, what are you doing there? Uh, building a house uh, in, in, you know, way out of town then he would have been, uh, you know, living in all the clusters of houses up here where that's, if he wanted silence and, and to be let alone, he should have stayed up where he was, not, you know, made a spectacle of himself down by the pond. Um, so he says in the opening that he lived a mile from any neighbor. Um, Ed Hosmer uh, was the closest house and, and they were best friends. Um, and so uh, he could walk up to Emerson's um, the, uh, just to orient, so the uh, famous North Bridge and the first battle of the American Revolution started in Lexington and carried over and it was in Concord when the uh, colonials turned and fired on the British, um, the old North Bridge, so it's a national park. And uh, Thoreau's sense that moving to Walden um, on July 4th, 1845, he said, uh, he acted as if it were coincidence, but of course, the Declaration of Independence was very, very much in his mind. Um, if you go to the pond today, this is, well, today it wouldn't quite, this is an October day. Um, this is a screen of trees, the house site, as I took this photo, is just to my right. It's a beautiful spot. It's been preserved. It's a lovely uh, state park, and uh, you'll find many people there using it for all kinds of reasons. Um, the house site itself is marked. Um, an archaeologist in the 20th century determined exactly where the house had stood, and that's marked with, by granite posts. There's no real memorial to Thoreau himself or his work, except for this immense pile of stones, which has grown even since mm -hmm. this old photograph was taken. Um, it became a tradition to honor Thoreau by, when you visit by bringing a stone and depositing it on this cairn in his memory, a, a very old uh, tradition. So uh, here's the, the sign as it looks today um, with one of his most famous um, uh, sentences from Walden and one that I always talk with my students about. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately and to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach. And not when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. So again, as a biographer, that's the sort of sentence you think about what it, what was he thinking? In what sense was he afraid of discovering that he had never lived? This man who lived so intensely. And of course, what does it mean to live deliberately? Um, and so when I teach uh, Thoreau, teach Walden, I talk to them about the deliberation as a kind of, you know, you can unpack the word. He loved words, he loved language, uh, he knew uh, Latin and Greek and Italian and French and German and uh, maybe even a little uh, native languages. Um, and deliberately, you hear the echo of liberty and you hear uh, librarians pick up on uh, libra, libra, the, uh, liber, the book, root for book. So upon on the freedom to read the world, to read books, to read uh, your surroundings, but also libra, the deliberation from the, the word, uh, from the root for libra, the uh, symbol of justice to weigh. Uh, to weigh cases, to and as I tell my students and try to help them to understand, when you uh, take a question to the courts of justice and put them before a judge who deliberates, right, that deliberation is on things that are difficult, for which there is justice potentially on both sides, and so you must weigh your thoughts and your uh, considerations and make those tough choices, and that that's what Walden tries to do, to deliberate, to weigh our choices in life and ask us uh, not uh, to forget that we should be doing that. So one of the things that Thoreau had to uh, 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 front, you know, one of the facts of life 
was the railroad because it did. And it's there today. This is now the commuter line uh, from uh, Boston out to Fitchburg, and it runs um, every half hour or so. I've taken it many times. And here it is uh, screaming down the tracks. And uh, from the uh, windows, if you're sitting on the uh, correct side of the train, you can look out at Walden Pond itself. And Henry's cabin at this, in this shot is just around this cove, tucked into the back of this uh, Furrows Cove there. So he could not escape technology, if anything. Again, it was like he moved out and built his little house on a platform that made him think about what was this railroad. It had only been built two years before, brand new. It was changing everything in America, and particularly in Concord. And um, you know, to, to stand um, in, in front of his doorway, uh, which is roughly where this um, um, picture is taken some decades later, and, and watch that train and listen and feel it and see what it was carrying and think about what it was meaning for America and for modern life, how life was changing, was, was a big part of what he was doing at Walden Pond. So this photograph gives you a sense of how close it was. It came past about 20 times a day. And after a long consideration of it, Thoreau's uh, closing comment I, about the railroad tracks, I cross the tracks like a cart path in the woods. I will not have my eyes put out and my ears spoiled by its smoke and steam and hissing. So he wanted to think about it, and when he was done, he wanted to turn his back on it. And uh, here is the house where he uh, sheltered himself uh, while he was uh, indoors writing, which he wasn't indoors much. Um, this is, of course, the replica at the parking lot. And if you see the chair uh, out, it means it's an invitation to come in and talk. And that's exactly what Henry did. Um, you could see his house from the road. If you uh, were walking by and you saw that he'd put the chair out in front, it said, hey, come on in. I'm happy to talk. And uh, many, many reports of all the people who came um, and chatted um, you know, about life and philosophy with Henry. Um, if the chair was not visible, it meant I'm busy. Please respect my privacy. And, uh, most people did. If they didn't, they got rebuked. Um, Henry was very jealous of his time. So when he was social, he was social. When he was not, don't bother him. Um, inside the house, this is a, an old photograph of the uh, uh, jumbled up, the way that these objects were gathered and, and literally shoved up in an attic for until the Concord Museum brought them out and dignified them by presenting them so beautifully. It gives you a sense of, uh, so here's the chair uh, that he used. He put on these rockers. Um, his famous green desk, which is almost a holy object for us now. It's where all his writing was done all his life. And there it is, just shoved in a corner. Um, but they kept it, at least. Um, they honored it. Um, and then his bed, which was a recycled platform, he nailed uh, the, the legs onto it from a Chinese sofa bed. Simplicity, truly simplify, simplify. So this was his basic furniture. He had another little side table, and he had a couple more chairs, but that was really it. Um, and so the, the point, of course, of, of simplicity to, to uh, create conditions where you could live deliberately. And uh, children would talk about how they would um, Rem they remembered the bed because when they came and visited, if they sat on that little uh, sofa, that little uh, bed, their feet could uh, just barely touch the floor. Again, the kind of nice memory uh, that helps a biographer understand. Um, it's, it raises the point that uh, these rocks are part of this kind of sharing. We can't visit Henry. People visit him virtually. Most of these rocks, if you pick them up and examine, or many of them at least, uh, have writing on them. People leave them, not just bare rocks, but messages. They sign them. They write um, comments and, and um, thanks to uh, Thoreau, who's become part of their life. And I like this one, happiness only real when shared. 
um, from Chris McCandless, um, the young man who in a Thoreauvian vein went to Alaska and was memorialized in uh, uh, John Krakauer's uh, book, Into the Wild. So we've got that strain of into the wild, right? And this young man had to discover in the wild um, the lesson that Thoreau teaches that it's the sharing, it's the sharing. And of course, famously, um, he, he died up in that bus. A, a very, very moving book and film, but very tragic. So Thoreau himself would, would um, bathe in the pond every morning. So this child, um, it's a swimming hole now, um, probably quite busy today. He really went there to write. And this photograph from the Morgan Library in New York uh, gives us, um, he wrote uh, um, using uh, the family pencils. There's a bundle of them, not many of those left. Um, and uh, he helped um, the family produce these pencils, but even more to the point for the family, um, and well, for us too, was he actually invented the number, two, call it the number two yellow pencil. Um, pencils were, um, very greasy and brittle in, in his youth. And he wanted literally to make a better pencil. So he knew that they made good ones in France, but he couldn't, nobody knew how. It was trade secret. So he got his chemistry textbooks together and, and just went to work on it as an engineering, prob um, as an engineering problem and uh, uh, figured out how you could mix graphite and clay and bake them as a ceramic and, you know, extrude it as a, as a rod and uh, so forth and uh, put the, encase the rod in uh, wood. He developed the machinery to do all these operations and as a result, for a while, these thorough pencils were some of the best made in America. Um, you could make them hard, you could make them soft, you could make them flat for carpenter's pencils, they made blue pencils. Anyway, so that was part of his, um, almost an extension of his body. And then the marbled papers, um, something else made, beautiful marbled papers, something else that his uh, father made in the family uh, factory. And uh, factory is too big a word. It's just, you've got to think about a little tiny shop. They're making all this stuff by hand. They just had a you know, handful of employees. And, uh, and these notebooks, his journals, um, that's where he did his thinking in this it's where all of his writing originates. So when he's protecting his time, not putting the chair out, come on. Uh, he's writing. And here is a photograph of the page. He opened a brand new notebook on his first full day at the pond. And this is the first entry. Um, when he's writing at his desk, he writes with a quill pen. So um, it's only out in the woods that he writes with pencil. Walden, Saturday, July 5th, 45. Yesterday, I came here to live. So he came to Walden to write, but not Walden. He came to write a book about his brother, the dear brother who he loved so much, who had died so tragically. And he wanted to memorialize um, their years together and, and their, their, what they had loved and shared. So that's the book he went to write, and then while he was there, he started taking uh, notes on what he was seeing, experiencing, thinking, and pretty soon, it, you could just feel it starts to turn into his second book, right? So it does become his second book, um, and this is where it starts. He also, as um, a mathematician, he um, enjoyed surveying. He loved the instruments. He loved the mathematical principles. And believe it or not, just for fun, his first winter, he did this survey of Walden Pond. And it becomes this famous moment. I think Walden self is really born in this moment of this, this survey when he starts to engage. It looks, I mean, if you start looking at what it took to do this, the kind of operation to, uh, he's drilling, he's making these lines. Each of these is a hole that he bored in the ice and each hole he, uh, dropped a plumb line and, uh, to the bottom of the pond, drew it up uh, to measure the depth of the pond, and so on. The whole thing is just an extraordinary, you know, engineering as art. It's, it's extraordinary, um, and, but it is typical of the way his mind works. The um, uh, 
Concord Museum has some of his actual surveying instruments. His survey uh, skills were so good and he enjoyed it enough that when um, his first book didn't make enough money to uh, make him the famous writer he had dreamed of being, um, well, he needed an income, he took to surveying. So um, we still have many of his original surveys and uh, as a, so he made his living as a civil engineer. He liked surveying because it got him outside <clears throat> into, uh, into nature and that was something. Uh, the, 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 the kind of practice of it engaged him. But the whole point of it is captured a little bit better by um, our, our philosopher today, Charles Taylor, Canadian philosopher, worries that our present sense of things fails to touch bottom anywhere that this is the condition of modernity, that we, we don't have any convinced, convincing sense of a kind of uh, solid truth. And this is not uniquely our moment. This was the moment that began in Thoreau's lifetime. And Walden becomes a response. As Thoreau writes at the end of Walden, let us not play at kitley benders. There is a solid bottom everywhere. So surveying the bottom of the pond, surveying his, the world around him became Thoreau's quest to find what he said, uh, solid bottom and rocks in place, right? So another, let us settle ourselves, this is from Walden to work and wedge our feet downward through the mud and slush of opinion and prejudice and tradition and delusion and appearance and sometimes I add fake news, right? That alluvian which covers the globe through Paris and London, New York and Boston and Concord, through church and state, poetry, philosophy, religion, politics, till we come to a hard bottom and rocks in place which we can call reality and say this is and no mistake. So there is the tone of Thoreau's quest, right? What is it that we can stand on as hard reality as, as firmness, and he, he liked the idea of building castles. Sure, build castles in the air, that's, uh, that's where they should be, but now put your foundations under them. So Walden was about, you know, you dream your castles, but then you have to found them on something solid. So here's the survey, which he retained and uh, had a professional engraver, uh, put it together all beautifully, and it, it became um, uh, the one illustration of the pond itself in Walton, which again is crazy. I always, I love at, to ask my students, think about it. If you were writing a book about your two year, idyllic, wonderful years living at a pond where you're doing thinking and writing, wouldn't you have a picture of the pond? Of course you would. <laughs> you, uh, this is his picture of the pond, an engineer's survey. So as somebody whose own background was originally in the sciences, um, I love this, this fascinates me. It's a different way of thinking, it's a thinking that is blending uh, notions that we normally keep very, very uh, widely uh, separated. So part of that thinking is to get you involved. Um, he says that he's looking for uh, the deepest part of the pond and he says that it, it occurs right where the greatest length meets the greatest width. But if you look, you'll see you have to add that line because it's not actually on his survey. And one of my students one time, I love, I love teaching when the students come up to you and, and point out things that as soon as she said that, I thought, of course. And she said, I think I understand why. I think he did that because he's forcing you to look at the survey and draw that line yourself in your imagination, maybe even on the page. And if you draw that line, then you find he's right. There's, there's the center of the pond, 102 feet. And so having drawn us in, made us participants in this act of surveying uh, this physical space, he then, uh, in Walden, draws the moral. 
uh, it is the heart and man, it's the sun and the system, always speaking in terms of these deep metaphors, draw lines through the length and breadth of the aggregate of a man's particular daily experiences and volumes of life into his coves and inlets, and where they intersect will be the height or depth of his character. So you could say the pond itself becomes an analysis of the human character, right? Or, or humanity itself, the question, not only of what is nature, but what is humanity? And to him, uh, to, to answer both those questions, they ultimately become the same question. Walden itself, that, that survey, I was fascinated. Uh, I got to reading about cosmograms and the, the um, uh, symmetry between the way Thoreau designed that survey and the kind of thought and care he put into it and the classic um, uh, cosmogram. This one comes from the Bokongo culture, which is where some of the slaves whose um, uh, cellar holes and remains of their houses um, around uh, Walden Pond, uh, Thoreau excavated and may have, may have actually seen some of these. Um, so the notion of the cosmogram dividing uh, the earth and our life into four quarters, the upper and the under, and uh, the kind of um, uh, sun, sunrise, sunset patterning, the cy cy cycles of life. Obviously, I could go on for a while, but that intrigues me. So you can actually follow Thoreau's cosmogram on the path around Walden Pond. Now it's been so well used, they've had to put these ugly fences up to keep people on the path because it was, they were eroding the banks. But this is at about 11 o'clock on, on that, um, if you imagine the cosmogram as a clock. And so you can actually take this circuit yourself and sort of think about this, this cosmology um, as a way of living a life, a kind of deeper philosophy. So Walden, there's the title page again. When he published it, he put as his motto, I do not propose to write an ode to dejection, but to brag as lustily as Chanticleer in the morning, standing on his roost, if only to wake my neighbors up, right? Be noisy about this, you know, stand up there and brag. This was the outer, the brag part of his personality. He was actually quite shy, very quiet and withdrawn, but he found a way of presenting himself in writing as this kind of almost Walt Whitman type, bold, um, daring, loud, um, and uh, some people find that a bit off-putting. I find it intriguing that he's willing to provoke us in these ways. The book ends with, and I finally, I looked at the manuscript ending, again held, uh, this is held at the Huntington Library in California. When you're a researcher, you get to go to all sorts of amazing places. And I was so startled to see this because it's not like this in the, in the normal printed version. <laughs> the famous last words, um, well, I better go to the next slide so you can read them too. So, picks up here, the light which puts out our eyes is darkness to us. Only that day dawns to which we are awake. There is more day to dawn the sun is but a morning star, right? And there's the biographer's thrill again to look at the manuscript of this and to see that originally he had a little small s sun, a little small m, a little small s, and that he wasn't satisfied with that, even though that's the way they're printed. If you buy a copy of Wald and read it, you'll see. He looked at that and he said, yeah more emphasis, the sun is but a morning star, double underlined. That triumph of that ending, the pride, the, the satisfaction, the sense of glory that he had created something of st such stunning beauty and found that, that what, he found his way into the soul of the universe in such a fundamental way and somehow had found the language to put it onto paper, that must have been a moment of triumph for him. If you go to Concord and visit him, you'll want to find his beautiful 
quiet uh, grave, uh, gravestone. It's um, one there with the rest of the family. And I always like to see whenever I visit, I'll be there next week. I'll see what things people have left um, because people bring, they leave flowers, of course, but they'll bring stones and pine cones and pencils. There's a mechanical pencil. There's always pencils, sometimes flocks of them. Uh, but it's very moving to me that people have, and con uh, have connected with him through time and continue to connect with him today. And it's to foster those connections, to, to show the kinds of communities that he built around him uh, in his own day and the way that those communities can extend to us today. That's really why I, read, uh, why I wrote the book. Um, they say that you should write the books that you want to read. That was the book I always wanted to read. And so I had such a, an extraordinary time um, writing it. And writing it here at Notre Dame, it was truly, truly um, the right book at the right place. And in the nick of time, too, published in 2017 for his 200th birthday. That's what I have to say. Now we have a few moments left for questions. So thank you very much. It's a small but wonderful audience. Thank you. Thank you. And so there's tons of things that I didn't talk about. And there may be questions um, that you came in thinking, or maybe something I said prompted a question. Yeah. How, how do you count the uh, number of years that you have in on this project? The number of years I was working? Um, I can't date exactly when, I, when the voice, I heard that voice. Um, because it was not the sort of thing that, <clears throat> you know, I didn't put it on the calendar, but it was only later I started wondering, just when was that? I think it was about 2000, uh, early, early 2009, maybe. I know I was, I was not at Notre Dame yet, um, and one of the um, reasons I came here was I really felt that to write this book, well, first of all, it would need time. Um, but also, I needed an environment um, where I could think about Thoreau's spirituality. Uh, when I saw the advertisement for the position I now hold, um, and I saw um, the, the way that it was worded, um, I thought, I should look into this, because Notre Dame would have quite, you know, people I could speak with and resources that I could draw on uh, to understand this combination of science. They have a history and philosophy of science uh, department or program here that I'm now affiliated with, uh, as well as the wonderfully deep um, and well-known Department of English, and of course, uh, religious studies and theology here. And I thought that is just the perfect combination. So to write this book will take time, but also that sense that you need, you know, I'm, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a theologian. I'm, you know, a historian of some extent, uh, and pretty good with certain kinds of literature, but I knew that I would need a community of people around me to help me think about the book, too. So it would have been uh, somewhere around 2009, and it was shortly after that that I saw the job ad and for Notre Dame and thought, that's, that's the place that could really nourish this book. And they, they've, done, they, they've done that. So. How did, how, how did you get that interaction with uh, theologians and history of science? Oh, well, the first thing, right from uh, when I came to campus and it started interviewing uh, for the position here, the, um, one of the people I met was uh, Catherine Brading, who was the uh, program uh, chair of the uh, History and Philosophy of Science program. And we just, I started talking with her about, about the philosophy and history of science, and uh, she, she made it very clear that with my background and interests that I would not just be somebody who would be on the fringe, that they would see me as part of that program, which was an incredibly exciting, because some programs like this are built such that they're very discipline specific, so you have to be um, a PhD in history or in philosophy with training, perhaps a degree in these sciences. Um, and I come to it through uh, literary studies, which, um, and, and to some extent, uh, sociology of science, which is um, 
you know, part of the mix, but not discipline specific. So, you know, knowing my publications and knowing my interest, uh, Catherine made it clear that that would be perfect for them. And meeting theologians, um, I mean, it's just part of, they're in the same building, you know, we're in meetings together, we, we meet at um, um, lectures. So, um, this is, this is um, uh, the Notre Dame allows these kinds of fruitful collaborations. Um, does that get to your question there? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought this was absolutely fascinating. Can't wait to read the book. Um, but I, one, one thing in particular that I really liked was that ending quote. Um, I read the book Walden back when I was in PLS, the Program of Liberal Studies here, mm -hmm. which was fascinating. And we read it more on the philosophy aspect. But yeah. it's kind of cool because that, that ending quote seems to be more of his expansion of consciousness in a way. But knowing the more biographical details, like you were talking about, it's almost like his, in a way, a send off to his brother, in, a, in that he's found that there's something beyond, that there's something more that maybe his his mm. his come to some terms with the passing of his brother, and that's sort of his yeah. his turn at the end. Yeah, I think you've captured very well that sense of that uh, that there's something more that his philosophy of, of life um, sort of originates. He was a very good classical scholar, um, and had ambitions to be a writer. He was studying with Emerson, but when his brother died, there was this a long period of silence in his journals. And then when he does start to write, um, he speaks in terms very much that that you just used that there must be something more, um, and he uh, speaks of, um, at first he can't go out into nature at all. Um, it it's just feels wooden and dead. And then he uh, starts to write of, um, like, but nature, nature is speaking to me. I'm, I'm broadly paraphrasing here. And what he hears is through, uh, through the the sounds of nature through the bird songs. His brother was a birder and loved birds especially. Thoreau started to write how um, walking out into nature gave him a uh, connection to his brother because his brother was in a sense speaking to him through all these experiences of nature. Uh, and then he wrote a poem that is absolutely um, a very moving poem. Um, uh, where dost thou dwell, my brother? And he writes of his brother going on before. And he says, you were always going on before. I was always the one following. And, that's, and so now you've gone on before, and you're calling to me. And, I'm, and I have to go out into nature to hear you. And all these places, I go and I hear you. So that sense of connection. Um, that when, when Thoreau talks about c connecting heaven and earth, that sense that somehow heaven is here, that somehow even his brother is here, or the human connection, which becomes a spiritual connection, is here, heaven under our feet, as well as over our heads, right? So it, it really does seem to me that it's, it's, it's as though you, f you could see it coming together as a kind of life's work. And the idea that he literally carries that life's work to Walden Pond as his first book, uh, which isn't that well known. A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers. I love it, but it's a very long, thoughtful, young man's book. It covers everything. If you haven't read it, you might actually really, being a PLS student, you might really enjoy it. Other, yeah. You mentioned that some of his journals were lost. Were they lost mm -hmm. inadvertently, or did his sister decide some she didn't want to retain? Well, the publishers, uh, for about the latter half, um, in terms of, do we, yeah, I'm supposed to repeat the question, do we have, um, um, why were the journals, some of them, lost? Um, the publishers of the 1906 edition of the journals uh, it turns out, took out a lot. And for about the second half of his life, that's uh, of, of the breadth of the journal, uh, we still only have that old 1906 edition in print. You can go look online at the transcripts, but they're very difficult to read. And I was shocked when I started doing comparisons to realize how many 
sort of expurgations there, there were. So there's that element. Uh, Thoreau himself, uh, we know he writes in college about keeping a journal um, and says this is a good thing. And it's clear that he's been doing something. Um, he, if you look at the published journal today, uh, the, the first sentence is, um, refers to um, Ralph Waldo Emerson cornering him on the street and saying, you know, do you keep a journal? And he writes, so I make my first entry today. I'm sure that he had some kind of journal going before that he destroyed. That becomes the first entry to his real journal, his transcendentalist journal. But after a few years, he takes all the pages that he'd written, thousands of pages, and he um, destroys almost all of it. What he does is he spends uh, months going through it and he copies out all the good bits into um, what becomes now the, the beginning of the journal as we know it. So he copies out the good bits, right, and destroys the rest. And then, for a long time, he's in the habit of uh, ripping pages out and, and recopying them and using them in his writings. So you, you open the journal volumes and you get a lot of ripped out, you know, the, the remnants of ripped out pages. And who knows what else was on those pages or what they looked like um, before he, uh, you know, revised them into the published works. And the mysterious thing, is that around um, 1850, he stops doing that. And it's very, very much um, a kind of, again, using the word, a deliberate act. That, and that's what's fascinating to us who are scholars of this. At some point, he starts thinking, the journal isn't something I just read and shred, and it's not just the good bits. The journal is actually um, its own work of art that has to have its own integrity and I will not rip out pages, and I will write every day. He wrote almost every day for the rest of his life. So that sense that a life well lived becomes a kind of uh, life well written emerges fairly late in life. Um, it's, it's really the last 10 years of his life that we have this incredible arc. So it's an interesting question, yeah. One of the disconcerting moments I had in my teaching here was I was doing a course, I, I teach an introduction to sustainability studies, and I did a, um, an exercise where I showed PowerPoints of 10 common uh, birds, animals, and plants. And I just was curious, would they know what these were? Um, and they, they knew about two of them. It, you know, I think they knew jaguar, and I'm trying to remember. Oh, they knew robin. Most of them knew robin, uh, the, but but anything else, and they weren't that difficult. In these these selections I made. I mean, I mean, really common, and it really startled me because we don't. And so I, the way I wrote the book, I wanted to have a sense of the physicality of the of the world that these people lived in, and also to communicate the, the sense that they did not experience, you didn't have to go out into nature. I mean, it, it just was, was there. So there's a moment where I'm talking about Thoreau's childhood, and uh, they kept a cow, and the cow wanders in, into the house in search of the pumpkins that are drying on the hearth. And I, and I love that, just, you know, think about that for a moment. This is a house that has a cow that's wandering around and the door is open and the cow just walks into the house and there's chickens and that this was normal. So when we read books that are written from this era and we import our own sense of our divisions and the way our tidy categories, this is not the way they're thinking and experiencing. And so the Thoreau's desire to bring children out, um, he was kind of, he was the guy, if you wanted to get the kids out of the house, you could, you could call him over and he'd get the kids out and they would go have adventures, as I said. And um, it becomes real clear that he, as a teacher, he would do field trips. This is one of his innovations. Um, he kept a school for a while and um, the kids all remembered how wonderful these field trips were. 
that this was an, not just a casual thing, but actually he's, he's thinking, as, as you were saying, that to build these connections requires uh, uh, getting young people to build them in their youth and make it part of play, make it part of their life. And that way they'll never lose that. But he would be just immensely distressed at the way young people grow up today. You know, nothing but virtual, you know, computer screen, con uh, no connectedness uh, with, with the ground under their feet or the environment around them, um, or the people, you know, actual people around them. He would, he would be, <laughs> he would be terrified for us in terms of what is that doing to our humanity. He'd also be terrified what is it that we are doing to our world, our planet. Um, so it's another reason to write the book, to try to, to, again, pass along that sense of waking people up to the conditions that we've created for ourselves. So thank you. I guess we're out of time. Thank you. This just flew by. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your weekend here at Notre Dame.